most people run their Kotlin code on the Java Virtual Machine, or JVM for short. But if you're like me, deep inside yourself you wanted a hundred times already how the hell Kotlin can be so concise, clean and expressive to read and write compared to Java, while in the end it will just be compiled to JVM bytecode nonetheless. So somewhere in the compilation chain there must be quite some magic to convert this to that. I analyzed almost 40 of Kotlin's features for you and represent you with the most intriguing ones in today's video. I'll show you how the Kotlin core developers pulled this off and what Kotlin code actually looks like once compiled to run on the JVM. But before we get started, please consider subscribing to the channel for many more videos like this one. One integral information first, before we dive into the topic. Don't worry, I won't explain how the whole JVM architecture works now. Although, if you'd like a video on that, let me know. Once you compile your Kotlin code with the JVM as the target platform, it will end up being bytecode that the JVM can then execute. At that point, it doesn't matter anymore, of course, if the original code was written in Java or any of the other languages that can produce JVM bytecode, such as Kotlin, Clojure or Scala. The JVM itself couldn't care less as long as the bytecode given to it is valid. Now, to be able to support all the cool features, the Kotlin compiler needs to do some heavy lifting since the JVM does only support so many constructs, which means that certain features that Kotlin offers might not be representable at all in JVM bytecode. How the hell did they solve that? The Kotlin compiler then has two major ways to implement the feature or construct of the language. Either enforce it within the Kotlin compiler, so before your code will ever even see a JVM, or find a way to represent the feature in Java, or rather bytecode. These two are more or less analogous with the typical front-end and back-end components of a compiler. For some of the most interesting ones we're going to look at now, I'll show you which technique was used and how. The JVM bytecode itself is quite hard to read, as it's just many lower level instructions. Therefore, for today's video, we are only going to take a look at Java code. You don't need to be familiar with how bytecode looks or works. So what I did is look at very many different Kotlin features, write a short example that uses each, compile them to JVM bytecode, and then decompile that to Java code again. This will allow us to see what the Kotlin compiler does without having to look at the bytecode itself, which, again, is very tedious to do. Let's kick it off with a straightforward example. Having functions on the top level of a file without any class around them is something that Java notoriously does not allow for. You can see an example for it right here. Kotlin solved this one very pragmatically by simply hiddenly wrapping a class around your functions. Since top-level functions are essentially static, as they can't retain any state in separate instances of themselves, this is precisely what happens here. We get a final class with the literal file name only with static methods inside, each of the ones that were in that same original file. Another thing you notice here is the way that the JVM requirement of having the dreaded public static void main array of string arcs was solved. The Kotlin compiler creates a separate method with that signature that simply calls our main method that does not require the arguments. This is often called a synthetic method, which I left in the code here, even though that modifier does not exist, of course. It's in essence a helper function or an overload. You'll be seeing these a lot in this video, as it's a nice way for Kotlin to offer a feature, but hide away some ugly JVM reality that comes with it from the end user. You might have noticed that the previous code could have been made more idiomatic by using the also extension function, like this. And I threw in an extra apply for seeing the full picture in a moment. Keep in mind that those are essentially just lambda expressions that can be invoked on anything. Check out my separate video on them if you are not very familiar with it yet. The magic here happens all due to the inline keyword that we can find on the definitions of the scope functions. This simply means that the lambda expressions just get unrolled essentially into the method directly with the lambda argument being literally bound to the called on value instead of creating a function object. If you want to know more about this topic, I'm considering producing a separate video about it. Please let me know below. Just quickly, if we instead save a lambda expression into a variable, this does result in a function object from the JRE 1.8, as there's no other way to pass around the closure with the arguments retained otherwise. There's one language feature that results in very similar code, the local function. It's perfectly legal in Kotlin to declare a function body within another function body, for instance for helper functions when using recursion. These are compiled to regular methods within the same wrapper class, with a dollar sign and their name appended to their parent function. This way there won't be any naming clashes. In the end, they are invoked just like any other method would. 
Another interesting thing that you can note here is that these nested functions are private, since of course Kotlin has to make sure that no other function can call them from the outside. Let's move to a feature that allows for extra idiomatic code, the overloading of operators. Within your Kotlin code, it looks like we can multiply this velocity data class by a number, which is quite intuitive when seeing the declaration, but this surely is not supported in Java. The way this works is simply due to the fact that when declaring the operator overload, one already needs to use the right function names plus the operator keyword. All the compiler does then is to replace the infixed asterisk in this case with a method called to the times method. Pretty straightforward. Colin gives us the great opportunity to name the values we pass to other methods, including constructors, to avoid bugs when adjacent types are the same or simply for improved readability. Note how right here I pass the arguments in the wrong order essentially. All that the compiler does in this step however is to sort the given values in the order that the method wants them and have it that way. So it just hides this step from the end user. Another thing we can spot right here are default arguments, which Kotlin unsurprisingly solves with a method overload, the same way one would have done it in Java. Interestingly, a separate, albeit unused, object is passed as an extra argument to never run into overloading ambiguity issues. When seeing this next one decompiled, I was pretty surprised myself. When you iterate over a range or progression, within Kotlin it looks like the range is constructed and then the loop begins, right? In reality though, the Kotlin compiler can be a lot smarter about it and thus make the code more performant. In the compiled code, no objects are ever constructed. Instead, the range loop is simply hard-coded with the values, while for the progression, simply the last value is determined and then in a while loop, an accumulator value is increased or decreased in this case until this last value is reached. Pretty damn smart. The next one is the first one of the bunch that is solely solved in the compiler itself. It results in straight up Java otherwise, the sealed interface. Since there is no such feature at the moment in older Java versions, the compiler will just spit out a regular interface at the end. The actual heavy lifting is simply happening beforehand, where it makes sure that the code only compiles if in this when statement we handle all the known implementations of our interface. Interestingly, since in theory we could add more implementations to the class pass after the Kotlin compilation finished, an else clause throwing a custom no when branch matched exception gets added to the compiled output for that edge case. Moreover, on the right hand side you can see what a singleton object from Kotlin results in. A classic Java singleton pattern. Let's move to the last one. Due to the type erasure that the JVM comes with, we can usually not check the class of a given parameterized type at runtime, as it will just be an object in the end. To overcome this limitation, the reified keyword exists, which lets us do precisely that. It is required to also add the earlier seen inline keyword to such a method, for a simple yet stunning reason. The Kotlin compiler, as expected, inlines the call to our reified method, but what it also just does with it is to essentially hardcode the class reference at each specific call site, since they would be lost due to type erasure otherwise. This means that if we invoke the reified method on an array of string, that is hardcoded there. If we would use it somewhere else, let's say on a string, that string.class would be hardcoded at that call site. Pretty ingenious solution, I gotta say. And by the way, the reified method itself is simply a hollow body at the end and remains unused. There's plenty more of these, over 30 more in fact, but we don't have time to cover those today. If you're interested in them and you'd like me to do a follow-up video to this one, let me know in the comments. Additionally, there's also a repository that I created on GitHub with examples for every single one of them. You'll find the link in the description. Let me know in the comments which language construct you found the most surprising when it comes to the implementation within the compiler. Apart from that, consider subscribing to the channel for many more videos like this one. Make sure to give this video a like if you enjoyed it and I'll see you next time. Tschüss!